Welcome again to the Death Row and Executions channel. I am Paco Rivera. Uh, you can also follow me on Facebook for more Death Row news and execution updates. There will be a link to my Facebook in the description below. Okay, so I'm going to do something a little different today. I'm going to jump ahead for a moment to some things that I want to discuss that I would normally leave for much later in the presentation. While researching this case, I kept coming upon this police sketch of the man police were looking for beginning in 1996 for the murder of a woman named Julie Buskin. And then I watched an episode of Forensic Files about this case and they showed this as the police sketch that was released to the media during the manhunt. So I wondered which one is the actual sketch? And I tracked down an article published by the Oklahoma Daily Newspaper, a newspaper that covers the region where the crime occurred, published on January 30, 1997, about a month after the murder, where the article begins by saying, Oklahoma police have released a sketch of a suspect wanted, and it showed this police sketch, which matches the one shown in Forensic Files. This means that the police sketch being circulated by supporters of death row inmate Anthony Sanchez, claiming that this sketch looks nothing like him, appears to be a desperate attempt to deceive the public. There were, in fact, two police sketches from two different eyewitnesses presented at trial. This sketch was provided by a man named David Kill, who saw a man driving Julie Buskin's car on the morning that she was abducted. In the days following the murder, he contacted police and provided a description of the man he had seen, and this sketch was created. The other eyewitness, and I'm not so sure that we can truly consider her a witness, as I will discuss in more detail later, was a woman named Janice Keller Merriman, who later contacted police and said that she thinks that she drove past that car that morning. But for some reason, she wasn't interviewed by police until two years later. And that is when she provided her description and a police sketch was created two years later. I haven't been able to verify that this sketch here is the one she helped create, but that does appear to be the case. And supporters of Anthony Sanchez and opponents of the death penalty are saying that this sketch looks nothing like Anthony Sanchez and looks a lot more like Sanchez's father, a man named Thomas Glenn Sanchez. Anthony Sanchez's supporters won't show you the sketch that was made in the days following the murder because that one does look more like Anthony Sanchez. Let me tell you a little about the father of Anthony Sanchez. In February of last year, 2022, Thomas Glenn Sanchez learned that he has cancer. Two months later, in April, a lump in his throat had grown to what was described as the size of a baseball, and he could barely speak. Glenn Sanchez must have known that he doesn't have much longer to live, and it appears that he got the brilliant idea to get his son Anthony Sanchez released from death row by telling his girlfriend, a woman named Charlotte Beatty, that it was he who raped and killed Julie Buskin, not his son. He then went out onto his girlfriend's front porch in the city of Midwest Oklahoma and shot and killed himself. It is apparent, however, that Glenn Sanchez was not too knowledgeable about how DNA works because it was the son's semen, the son's DNA, that was found at the crime scene, not the father's. Did Glenn Sanchez think that because they are father and son that the DNA was going to be the same? 
Charlotte Beatty, the girlfriend, would sign a sworn statement saying, oh, her boyfriend has been confessing this to her since the year 2020, that it was he who raped and killed Julie Buskin. Sure, because how would it look if Charlotte put in the statement that Glenn Sanchez told her that right after he found out that he was dying of cancer? If what Charlotte Beatty is saying is true, that means that she stayed with a man who had confessed to rape and murder an additional two years and didn't tell anybody about it. And it means that the father had allowed his son to rot on death row the past two decades for something that he and not the son had done. This is the story of a young college student named Jewel Buskin, known to everyone as Julie, whose life was taken from this world way too soon, when she was just 21 years old, just days before Christmas in the year 1996. Julie Buskin from Benton, Arkansas, had just completed all her college courses for a bachelor's degree in dance at the University of Oklahoma College of Fine Arts, where she excelled in ballet and had just presented her final performance on stage there in a rendition of Tchaikovsky's Swan Lake. Julie was preparing for a trip back to her hometown of Arkansas, where she would continue schooling with the hopes of one day opening a dance studio. Her parents, Mr. and Mrs. Buskin, would drive from Arkansas to Oklahoma to pick up Julie and take her back. On the night before she was murdered, now Thursday, December 19th, 1996, Julie had dinner with a male friend named Ryan James, who she worked with on a golf course, and they planned to meet again for lunch the following afternoon. Julie later that evening got together with some friends to exchange early Christmas gifts and to say her goodbyes since she was headed back home to Arkansas. Later that night, she met up with her roommate and best friend, Megan Shrek. Megan was also headed back home and she had a flight scheduled for about six o'clock in the morning at Will Rogers Airport. And Julie agreed to drive Megan to the airport in the morning. Sometime after midnight, now it's officially Friday, December 20, the two girls decided to just stay up the rest of the night because of the early trip to the airport and they spent several hours together at a restaurant called The Kettle. A few hours later, they went back to their apartment, Megan picked up her bags and Julie drove Megan to Will Rogers Airport, dropping her off there at about five o'clock in the morning before heading back to the apartment, about a 30 minute drive to the Dublin West Apartments on East Lindsay Street in Norman, Oklahoma. That complex today is known as Highland Park Apartments. Julie was driving her red Mitsubishi Eagle Summit. At about 5.30 in the morning, 911 received a call from a man living in the Dublin West Apartments saying that he and his wife just heard a loud, blood-curling scream from a woman outside in the parking lot and that he was afraid to go out there. A Norman, Oklahoma police officer named William Alves, who also lived at the Dublin West Apartments, would later tell investigators that he heard a scream in the parking lot about 5.30 and he went outside, but when he got out there, nobody was there. A woman named Jackie Evans, who lived directly across the street from Julie Buskin, said that she heard a woman scream and then heard a man yell, just shut up and get in the car. Later in the afternoon, Julie's friend and co-worker, Ryan James, arrived at the Dublin West Apartments to pick her up for their lunch date, but neither she nor her car was there. Ryan later went to work and after work, he went back to the Dublin West Apartments and Julie was still gone. Ryan began to worry that something was definitely wrong here and he contacted police. 
to let them know that Julie is missing. Now, police don't normally go searching for a 21-year-old woman who was last seen a few hours ago. That's just protocol. But that scream in the parking lot that was reported by multiple neighbors during the early morning hours changed all that. Julie Buskin's parents, Mr. and Mrs. Buskin, then arrived from Arkansas to pick up Julie. Police told them that their daughter is missing. Later that night, about 12 hours after the screams were heard in the parking lot, a man walking along the roadway near Lake Stanley Draper noticed down in the embankment what appeared to be a body partially submerged in the water. He contacted police. Julie Buskin's body had been found. Julie's hands were tied together behind her back with shoestrings. The medical examiner reported that Julie was raped and shot in the back of the head with a 22 caliber gun. Investigators and crime scene technicians that processed the scene found footprints that would later be determined as coming from a size 9 Nike Air Max 2 running shoes worn by whoever killed Julie. Investigators also found a pink leotard on the ground with the initials J.B. written on the label, obviously belonging to Julie Buskin, a garment that she must have been wearing at some point under her clothing. Investigators found semen on that leotard. DNA was obtained from the semen and then entered into the FBI CODIS database, but no match was found. It would be eight years later, in the year 2004, when the CODIS system gets a matching hit on that DNA. Meanwhile, it was still 1996, and the manhunt for the unknown man walking around with that DNA was taking place. Several hours after the discovery of Julie Buskin's body, her red Mitsubishi Eagle Summit was found parked in the parking lot of an apartment complex near the Dublin West Apartments where Julie lived. This led investigators to believe that the killer lives nearby or has a friend in the area. Since he returned all the way back from the lake located about 15 miles away. Investigators also learned that Julie's cell phone was missing and when they requested a call log from the phone company, it showed that someone attempted to place a call to a phone number that was out of service or that doesn't exist. Please keep in mind this phone call to a bad number as it will come up again later with an explanation as to why it happened. Lastly, a lab provided investigators with a ballistics report on the bullet fired from the gun that killed Julie Buskin. This ballistics report will also come up again later in this discussion. The murder of Julie Buskin, the talented ballet dancer from the University of Oklahoma, was all over the news. And a man who had seen the news contacted police. His name was David Kill. David stated, that he was on his way home from an all-night shift at Tinker Air Force Base at about 7.15 in the morning when a red compact car with an Arkansas license plate driving away from Lake Stanley Draper suddenly cut him off. David became very angry by the man's driving and followed him into the city of Norman at high speed. After seeing news reports, he realized that he had seen the car involved in this case and the man who was driving that car. David gave a physical description of the driver and helped the forensics artist develop this composite drawing, this police sketch, the one I showed here at the start of this presentation. David described the young man as young, possibly in his early 20s, with collar length hair. Bear in mind now that the father at the time looked nothing like that. Unfortunately, all leads in the case that included a DNA dragnet of samples collected from hundreds of men from the University of Oklahoma and neighbors eventually went cold. A woman named Janice Keller Merriman had also contacted police saying 
that she believed that she saw Julie's Red Eagle Summit on the morning that Julie went missing. Janice Merriman was interviewed by police two years later and provided this description drawn out by a forensics sketch artist. Then, in the year 2004, a 26-year-old man named Anthony Castillo Sanchez was serving time in jail for assault and second-degree burglary. That would make Sanchez 18 years old when Julie Buskin was killed in 1996. As a felon, Anthony Sanchez's DNA was collected and entered into the FBI's CODIS database. And boom, it triggered a hit to the DNA from the Julie Buskin murder. Detectives learned that at the time of Julie Buskin's murder, Anthony Sanchez lived less than a mile away from the Dublin West Apartments where she was abducted and a short distance away from where Julie's car was found. They learned that he had a girlfriend named Kristen Setzer and they went to interview her. Kristen told police several interesting things. One, she kept a diary and in it, a couple months before the murder, she had written that Anthony bought her a pair of Nike shoes and got a pair for himself as well. Remember that the shoe prints found at the crime scene match a size 9 Nike Air Max 2 running shoes. Anthony Sanchez now says that he wears a size 11 so those shoes couldn't be his. However, I looked at all the transcripts and reports on this case and at no time during trial did his defense raise that issue. Anyway, back to the girlfriend, Kristen Setzer. Two, Kristen provided detectives with the phone number that she had in 1996. And guess what? Remember that call that someone made from Julie Buskin's cell phone after she was dead to a non-working phone number? The girlfriend's phone number was just one digit off. There was a one digit difference from that number that was called. Three, Kristen told detectives that she once heard gunshots inside the home where Anthony Sanchez was living with his parents. And when she went inside later, she saw bullet holes in the wall. She figured someone was playing with a gun and thought it amusing to shoot holes into the wall. Well, a team of crime scene technicians went to that home and looked for those bullets in the wall. Bear in mind now that this was about eight years later and those walls had already been repatched and painted. But a 22 caliber bullet from the wall was eventually recovered and sent to a ballistics lab. And it positively matched the bullet that killed Julie Buskin. The woman that I spoke about earlier, Janice Keller Merriman, who provided that second police sketch to police, later testified at trial. David Kill, who first gave police a description, also testified at trial. Here in a news report from the Oklahoman during the 2006 trial showed how Janice Merriman testified how she thinks she thinks that she saw Anthony Castillo driving Julie's car and that Julie was in the passenger seat. She also provided, two years after the events, a description to a forensics artist that created this sketch. A defense attorney then showed David Kill that composite drawing Oklahoma City Police had drawn based on Janice Merriman's description of the driver. When asked if that was the driver that David Kill saw, he replied, absolutely not. A prosecutor would say that the drawings were done by two different artists and the drawing based on Janice Merriman's description was done two years after Julie Buskin's death. It should be noted once again from a woman who thinks she saw Anthony Sanchez. To put it simply, the prosecutor is basically implying that this police sketch, the one provided by a woman two years after the fact, who thinks she saw Anthony Sanchez and Julie Buskin, 
is trash, for lack of a better word. This sketch that Anthony Sanchez supporters and opponents of the death penalty are plastering all over the internet, letting you know that this looks nothing like their guy. As I mentioned at the start of this video, Anthony Sanchez's father, Glenn Sanchez, had been diagnosed with cancer in February of last year. And two months later, he apparently came up with a marvelous plan to have his son exonerated from prison by going over to his girlfriend's home with a lump in his throat that had grown to about the size of a baseball and telling his girlfriend, Charlotte Beatty, that it was he who raped and killed Julie Buskin and then went out onto Charlotte's front porch and committed suicide by shooting himself. Charlotte Beatty would sign a sworn statement that Glenn Sanchez had been confessing this to her since 2020. She just decided to never mention it to anyone. So multitudes of Anthony Sanchez supporters and people against the death penalty have jumped all over this. So aside from the trash police sketch that everyone agrees looks nothing like Anthony Sanchez when he was 18 years old, they are basically saying, here you go, you got your confession, right from the words of the girlfriend who wrote it on paper after Glenn Sanchez killed himself. So the state of Oklahoma, to put this matter to rest, got a hold of Glenn Sanchez's DNA. Just in case, there is a 1 in 94 quadrillion chance of Glenn Sanchez having the same exact DNA as his son Anthony. The Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation concluded that the father's DNA does not match the DNA evidence from the pink leotard. Oklahoma Attorney General Gentner Drummond stated, what makes this claim all the more despicable is that it makes a mockery of how advances in DNA evidence have exonerated wrongfully convicted individuals in recent years. Just as DNA evidence has helped clear the innocent, it can also conclusively show guilt. Anthony Sanchez is guilty beyond any conceivable doubt, and I will ensure justice is served. Here it appears that Anthony Sanchez refused to walk and had to be carried by officers. I found a really nice tribute on Jewel Julie Buskin that reads, An aspiring ballerina from Benton, Arkansas. Jewel graduated from Benton High School in 1993, then went to study ballet at the University of Oklahoma College of Fine Arts. She was a bright, eager dance student. She loved the extensive practice and demands for precision that went with ballet dancing. She gave her grandest performance in Swan Lake, displaying the aptitude and pleasure she had always taken in her field of choice on December 13, 1996. Her graduation from Oklahoma University was at hand, and she would have returned home to Benton and gone on to the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville to pursue a master's teaching program to become a ballet teacher and open a dance studio. Please subscribe for more Death Row and upcoming execution stories. Remember that you can also follow me on Facebook for more Death Row news, execution updates, videos, and more. There will be a link to my Facebook in the description below. I'm Paco Rivera. Bye.